Welcome back to That Wasn't In My Textbook, the bi-weekly podcast that helps us uncover the things we always wish we learned from that boring, bulky textbook. I'm your host, Toya, and you're now listening to a very special episode that's a part of the Well Red Black Girl Festival this weekend. It's episode 11, and it's called The Suffrage Movement, The Age-Old Karen Problem. Happy Friday, everyone. I am super excited because normally I'm just excited for every episode. But today I'm super excited because this episode is a part of the Well Read Black Girl virtual festival that kicks off this weekend today. Now, the Well Read Black Girl Festival is a three day experience, kind of like a family reunion with your homies that celebrates black writers and black women readers. Now, I just want to be honest that I am a well read black girl fan. They have a very strong IG presence and newsletter. They have over 400K followers. I've been following the founder, Glory, for about three years. I've attended all of the festivals. I have all of the t-shirts, the sweatshirts, and the totes. I read all the newsletters and mostly read all the books that they recommend for the most part. So I am a true fan, stand, groupie, well-read Black Girl Beehive member, like whatever y'all call their fan group. I am probably the vice president. Um, So I just wanted to let y'all know that so you know that it's real and you understand how hyped I am about it. Now, if you're a new listener, because I know we have some new listeners who came here for the Well Read Black Girl Festival, I just want to welcome you. I want to tell you that you're listening to one of the funnest, dopest, rawest. I don't know if all those things are even words, but we don't care on this podcast. We're not very uh, pretentious over here. Um, But you're a part of this family and I encourage you to subscribe and for all of my, you know, ride or dies, welcome back. Today we're going to learn another out of the textbook topic with some mind blowing ish. Okay. (laughs) Now, I already kind of talked about it, but let me give you some more details about this three day virtual experience that is free and it's virtual because COVID is real. But over the course of these three days, there are panels, readings, poetry, flowetry, celebrations, mornings, studying with REL Red Black Girls and Black Women Writers. This weekend, you'll be introduced to new writers that you might not know yet, and you'll also run into some well-known writers like Nikki Giovanni, who is closing the festival on Sunday. Uh, you might not want to miss that one, so you should you should write that down somewhere. The schedule for all the events can be found on wellreadblackgirl.com. This year's festival's theme is Black Political Power, Past and Present, which is perfectly fitting as we wait for the ballots to be counted still. I mean, well... For me, when I'm recording this, they're still being counted like hello, Pennsylvania. And this theme is perfect because this year is also the 100th anniversary of the passing of the 19th Amendment that gave women the right to vote. So in line with the festival on Black Political Power Past and Present, today's special well-read Black Girls episode focuses on the Black suffrage movement, the age-old Karen problem. We will be joined by Glory, the founder of Well Read Black Girl, who's going to tell us all about it, what it is, what the festival is, how the theme all connects, and some events we definitely should check out. And then we will be joined by Yvette Dion, the author of Lifting As We Climb, The Black Woman's Battle to the Ballot Box. When Glory approached me about doing this podcast episode a couple weeks ago, I couldn't, I didn't know what to do with myself. Like I was very excited. I felt a lot of pressure because, you know, y'all, there are some dope women that are part of this community 
And there's some dope women in the lineup for this weekend. So I felt truly, truly honored. And when she told me the theme was black political power, past and present, I was like, okay, like I have to talk about black women because a lot of our textbooks talk about the fight for women's rights to vote and like burning bras and all the other stuff. And often that credit goes to white women like Susan B. Anthony. But have you heard of Frances Harbor or Mary Churchill? Probably not. And don't worry, I'm going to tell you about them. But these are women that are critical to the movement. And so we're going to talk about them today. Today's episode is organized a little bit differently than our traditional episodes. We're going to start with a 10 minute chat that we have with Glory, the founder of Well Read Black Girl. She is going to tell us all about this weekend's activities, how she changed a phrase on her shirt to a whole movement that has over 400k followers and she's also going to give us a list of events that we should definitely check out this weekend and then I'm going to give you a brief background of the black suffrage movement just defining it and then giving you three and a bonus <laughs> list of unsung sheroes that are a part of the black suffrage movement that should be in our textbooks And after I give you some background on the history, we'll go into an interview with Yvette Dion, the author of Lifting As We Climb, who will give us a more in-depth historical context. She'll talk to us about the past and the present day black suffrage that we should be celebrating and all the things we should know about the movement in general. Okay, now let's go talk to the founder, Gloria, about all things Well Read Black Girl and this festival. Hi, Glory. Hello. <laughs> thank you so much for joining me and thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this year's Well Read Black Girl Festival. Um, I'm very excited to be a part of this. <laughs> I am excited to have you. I have been following you for a minute and I'm so glad that you have your new podcast and our worlds collided in the most perfect way. So thank exactly. you. Yeah, and I remember going to like the first festival and the second one. So yes, we've been riding with each other before outside, before all of this. So <laughs> it's exciting to see both of us like evolve and come together. Yes, yes. So for everyone who's listening, they might not know what Well Red Black Girl is, although they should, you know, it's one of the greatest things ever. But could you just tell us about like how Well Red Black Girl came to be and how you started doing these dope festivals? So the origin story is really simple. I was new to New York. I needed some friends. And I had this incredible t-shirt, similar to the sweatshirt that I'm wearing. Ooh, that my oh, I have that wearing. sweatshirt. I have that sweatshirt. <laughs> and then we got to represent. Um, <laughs> And so I was wearing this t-shirt that my boyfriend made for me and folks would come up to me like, oh, I'm well read too. Where'd you get that shirt from? And we would go into these conversations about books and Toni Morrison and all the good things on the New York subway. And it like, I was like, okay, like, there's something here. I'm new to the city. I want to meet people. So how can I bring books together with other black women and like form just just like essentially a regular old book club mm-hmm. and what made it different was I ended up inviting Naomi Jackson to the first book club because we were reading her new book and she was hella cool me and my, my me and Naomi are now friends um but like she her saying yes to come to my book club at the time is what changed the trajectory of the whole community it allowed us to talk to her about her book her writing process what it was like to be a first-time author and that really was what kicked everything off like I don't know if well-read black girl would be what it is if Naomi hadn't accepted my invitation and came to that first book club years ago and now fast forward we have a writing group, we have a festival, we have like this whole like movement happening in in publishing because of that, yes. So a lot of things can happen when you're looking for community and you're looking for friends and you're just like enthusiastic about connecting with other people. Yeah, and I'm happy that you said that because you know, I moved to LA almost, almost two years in January, but that was the first thing that I did was like, I was like looking for book clubs and I found that there was a well-read black girl chapter book club at book soup 
And I started going there and I found a community with the women there. And I was like, book clubs, I always tell people now, I'm like, if you're moving to a new state and you're trying to make friends and you read, right. like, book clubs are the way. Right, it's true. And, like, and if you join a dope book club, like you really will find like-minded people and it'll go into other worlds. Like you start talking about professional stuff. You start like talking about music. You start talking about what's going on in your everyday life. It doesn't just stop at the book. Yeah. So I am also a proponent of, finding book clubs or volunteering, finding a way to like connect with other people around something that you enjoy doing. Yeah, definitely. So thank you for that. Okay, yes. so we, we figured out, how, well, you told us how the book club came about. So can you tell us about this year's theme, which is Black political power past and present? Like how did you come up with that theme and what's the significance that people should know and appreciate throughout this weekend of the festival? Well, girl. <laughs> Wait for the votes to be counted. <laughs> right. Today is November 4th, and clearly we are in this, like, dumpster fire of a fucking year, and we need some levity. We need some relief from all the bullshit that is happening. And last year, our theme was Reading for Resistance. It was all, I mean, essentially the same theme, the idea of, like, how can we come together and collectively fight against what's happening in the White House, what's happening just all over the world when it comes to black and brown bodies. Um, so I thought, you know, I want to have the festival after the election because whatever happens, we're going to need space to really gather and discuss and process the events, you know, whether it's a celebration or it's another four years of God knows what, you know. So I just really wanted to have something to pay tribute to the black political leaders that have been um, just doing the work, you know, whether you're in a political office or you're a community activist, there's just so many amazing black women are, that are doing the work and I wanted to pay tribute to that. And also this year is the 100th anniversary of the 19th amendment. Yeah. And too often that credit goes to white women and that is not the case. There were plenty of black women doing amazing things during that time period, whether it's Ida B. Wells or Sojourner Truth or Mary Church Terrell, like there's just so many people that we don't acknowledge historically. And so I wanted all those things to come together between the election, between just honoring our ancestors and having people just be present when it comes to reading and literature and also being politically involved. So involved so you know it was just like all those things I was thinking about I was like how am I gonna be feeling after November 3rd will I have anxiety yes probably <laughs> right well that's great so it was just go ahead sorry no no I'm just saying like I it was like all those things so I'm glad it came together in such a beautiful way and we're going to be celebrating this weekend yes I'm excited about that and I actually ended up in March, like Women's History Month, I did like a event celebrating the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment where I like highlighted Black women. So when you reached out to me, I was like, this is perfect. And we did um, recreated photos of women, you know, past and present that have to do with like politics. And we did like RBG and like all those stuff. So it was like really cool to like do that with. You have to send that to me so I can put it on the feed. I really <laughs> We did that with like a, I did that with the CUNY school in New York in March. So that was really, that was really fun. So I'll definitely send you those. And so then my last question, because I know you're busy, you're getting ready for this festival weekend, is if someone is new to Well Read Black Girl and also like new to this dope theme that you have about Black political power, what are two or three or maybe four <laughs> events you would recommend they check out? Because you have a whole weekend of events really starting from Thursday all the way to Sunday. Right. Yes. Yes. So I definitely would ask people to check out our Instagram conversation to get a little bit more on Friday at yes. one thirty. Um, so we'll be talking more about the podcast. You'll be talking directly with Yvette, who is the brilliant author behind Lifting As We Climb. Um, I recommend that number one. And <laughs> then on Saturday, we open up with Alex L., who I've been following on Instagram for the longest time. She just has such a great way of telling her own story and really exuding this sense of like confidence and sharing her affirmations with the world. She has a new book out. Let me find it. I love the cover. I remember that yeah. cover. 
rain. It's so yeah, pretty. After the rain. After the yeah. rain. And it is just like such a soothing meditation. Like I'm really enjoying reading it. And I can't wait to talk to her about her process and how she just is coping with everything that's going on. So that is going to be the opening panel on Saturday at 10 a.m. So please, please check that out. I also recommend for the young people that are watching, because this is all about being intergenerational, you know, talking to the grandmas, talking to the teenagers, everything. Okay, everybody. Everybody, <laughs> everybody come through. So we have Punching the Air, which is a book by E.B. Zaboy and Yusuf Salam. And if you're not familiar with Yusuf Salam, he is um, one of the members of the Exonerated Five. And oh, this wow. is a YA novel written in verse. Just, it's not like a, a, a true testament, but it's kind of inspired by his experience being arrested and falsely accused as a young person. And it's just beautifully done. I think it's a great read for young people to understand what incarceration can do to a family, can do to a young person, especially when it's uh, a wrongful conviction. Mm -hmm. um, and so she and so Evie and Yusuf will be in conversation and Ebony Liddell will be moderating. And that is also happening on Saturday. Okay. Then what else is happening? I mean, there's just so many great there's events. A um, there's a lot of stuff. So like and definitely the speaker, the key, like who, can you talk about the keynote speaker this year? Uh, hello. Ah. The closing keynote is Nikki Giovanni. What the oh. fuck? Like, oh. see, like, like, you don't understand. I have been, I am a huge, huge fan of her work. Like, so much of the work that I do is inspired by her and, like, just her effortlessness. I can't, I don't want to say effortless. It's not effortless because it does take work, but, like, she just has this energy of being very honest and candid in her writing and how she talks to young people. The fact that she has her thug life, Tupac tattoo, like it's everything I aspire to be as I become an elder, like just yeah. really open and connecting with young folks. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm excited. Like I'm, I'm so excited. And what day is that? That's on Sunday, November 8th. Okay. At 4 p.m. So that's a close. And right before that, we're going to have um a, about six poets paying tribute to her so they're going to be reading her poetry and doing some of their own original work and just like giving thanks for her being our like literary forebother so yeah, yeah. thank Give you giovanni. how could i forget that like that, that is like definitely the highlight <laughs> of the weekend is thank you giovanni um there's just so much and i just think like and it's because it's virtual people can plug in whenever they're ready like as you're washing the dishes if you want to be like you know glued to the computer all eight hours I like how whatever you need to do, just to show up and feel good and be, you know, take a break from all the crazy all election stuff. <laughs> that's gonna be there and we're gonna handle it because apparently uh, so far, I think 91% of black women have voted. Ooh. Right, don't quote me on that, but I feel like that's like a fact that I saw. <laughs> on I, believe it. I believe it. <laughs> Yeah, like we always show up. So we are going to continue to show up. So we need to take time to care of ourselves, read, meditate, listen to a good podcast and just like, just have some fun, you know? Like I, I'm just looking forward to having a, like a really good time and talking to the people that I love and I admire. It's almost like a celebration in the midst of all this craziness. It's a celebration of, of books and literature and art. So yes, all of that. And it's like, it's us coming together. I always call it like um, I think of it as a family reunion. It's like it's our little virtual family reunion. We're gonna come through. We're gonna wear our t-shirts. We're gonna have you know like we're gonna make have some chicken on the side. Like just hang out, have a little virtual barbecue. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I try not to take myself no, too seriously. Sorry. Yeah. Like I know it's I, that's good. Look, like, I I want it to be fun. I want it to be like a learning experience, but. I'm I'm nobody's professor. I'm not gonna like lecture to no one, you know. Like I'm just gonna sit and ask questions and like explore ideas. And if someone isn't dis disagrees, we can like unpack that. Like it's all good as long yeah. as we're doing it together and we're being respectful. You know what I mean? Yes. Well, I'm gonna let you go. But before I let you go, could you tell people like where they can like what kind of like where they can check out more about Well Read Black Girl and then where they can check out more for the festival this weekend so they can see the schedule and they can like click in on all these dope things. Oh, yes. 
So you can find details at wellreadblackgirl.org. That's where the full festival schedule is. And if you want to follow us on social media, majority of our our like activity is on Instagram. So it's at wellreadblackgirl. And we just launched a new Patreon. If you, yes, I, that, that's like a, a really new thing that we just like launched this week. Um, just because everything being virtual and the pandemic, we, I've been really thinking as the like pandemic as portal, like how can we like really take ourselves into a new environment and try to figure out how to reimagine things. Yeah. And I've been, I've been writing so much over the last couple of mm-hmm. months. So girl, I got some projects oh. and I was like, I need to write with other people. So I was like, this could be like a really fun way to talk about like, you know, things that I'm trying to work through and help other people at the same time. So we'll see. Like so far, a couple of people have signed up and we're like going back and forth in the forum. So that is just at patreon.com slash wellreadblackgirl. So there's plenty of ways. Hit me up, <laughs> like a post, definitely come to the festival yeah. and listen to the podcast because it's amazing. Thank you. No, thank you, girl. Oh, wow. I love talking to Glory. She's just so warm and loving. Thank you for taking your time to chat with me. Now that Glory has put us on to all the Well Red Black Girl information that we should know, let's talk about some history. As always, we start with the definition. So what is the definition of suffrage and the black suffrage movement? Now the word suffrage means the right to vote in political elections. Black suffrage refers to black people's right to vote. Now the black suffrage movement really emerged after the American Civil War when enslaved people were emancipated. So after the North and the South fought and the North won and slavery was over, we start to see the rise of this black suffrage term. But you need to note that the black suffrage term was really referring to black men only, not women. And black women are at this intersection of having to deal with racism and sexism. So we had a lot of hurdles to face. So generally speaking, You know, after the American Civil War, we have three groups. We have black men, we have black women, and we have white women fighting for the right to vote. Skipping ahead, everyone's fighting. Boom. In 1870, the 15th Amendment is passed that gave black men the right to vote and denied being discriminated against based on their race, color, or previous conditions of servitude. Now, this is where we start to see the, the split divide, because once black men got the right to vote, white women and black women were left in the battle to vote. And this is where the beef starts, because white women, a.k.a. the Karen originals, started to feel some type of way that black men were able to attain the right to vote before them. Uh, tell us how you really feel, Karen. And so then for many white women, instead of joining forces with black women for the right to vote, they separated themselves. And that's when we see the formation of clubs and conventions for and by black women. For example, the National Association of Color Women's Club was one of the most popular black suffrage groups, and it was founded by Harriet Tubman. Uniquely, you know, black suffrage and other members like Ida B. Wells realized that it was impossible to solely focus on the right to vote. They also would have to talk about race and discrimination that existed in the 1890s, something the white suffrage didn't experience and weren't focused on. So that's how the black suffrage movement really started to form. As I already mentioned, the Underground Railroad conductor, Harriet Tubman, was a part of, was a suffrage, and so was Ida B. Wells. So that's just a general overview of the early beginnings of the suffrage movement. Our guest will get a little bit more in depth for us. But before we talk to her, I want to just give you a list of three plus a bonus black suffragists that we all should know. I already mentioned Harriet Tubman, and I also mentioned Ida B. Wells, but let me give you a little bit more context on Ida B. Wells, because she was a badass. 
Now, I consider Ida B. Wells the original Rosa Parks because on a warm day in September in 1883, At 21 years old, she purposely sat in a white-only section of a train. And nobody could make this move, okay? There were two passengers and a conductor who were trying to get her out of her seat, and they could not do it. They ended up tearing her dress and ripping a sleeve off. And it actually took another set of three dudes to finally get her up. And she didn't move from the white section to the black section. She just got off the train. And she ended up suing them. And in a Supreme Court case, she won and then it was overturned. But anyway, that was the beginning of her activism. She was an active suffrage and a journalist who led an anti-lynching movement in the United States in the 1890s. She had her own newspaper, free press, and she did other countless things that got us to this place right now as black women who can vote. So thank you, Ida B. Wells. Another black suffrage that we should know is Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. She got four names. Frances was an early abolitionist and woman suffrage leader. She was born to free parents in Baltimore, Maryland, that still enslaved people in its borders. So I can only imagine what it was like to be free in a state that still enslaved people, like That probably was a very scary experience. You probably faced a lot of discrimination. I have a lot of questions that I probably couldn't even handle answers to. But she started writing poetry about the sadness she felt after her parents' death and about the hope she had for all to be free. Her poems were so fire that by 20, she had already published a poetry book called Forest Leaves. And she later had a novel that was one of the first books published by a black woman in the United States. She went on to teach and be a part of the Underground Railroad. And seeing the brutality of slavery sparked her to join the anti-slavery society. And she later joined the American Suffrage Association. She is one of the few African-American women who are present at conferences and speaking up for women to have the right to vote. Thank you, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. We appreciate you. Another unsung Shiro black suffrage that we should know is Mary Church Terrell. She was the daughter of former slaves. Her dad, Robert, was a successful businessman who became one of the South's first black millionaires. I wonder what that experience was like for you, Robert. Mary Church Terrell attended Oberlin College in Ohio as a young woman where she became the first black woman to earn a college degree. Kudos to you. Her activism was sparked in 1892 after her friend Thomas Moss was lynched in Memphis by whites who were salty that his business was competing with theirs and his business was probably better. After moving to D.C., Terrell became involved in the women's rights movement, joining forces with Ida B. Wells. She focused on securing women's right to vote. She toured the country to lecture on the issue. In 1896, she and fellow activists founded the National Association of Colored Women. The model was Lifting As We Climb, which is a part of today's special guest book title. Terrell ended up being the president of one of the first presidents of that association. After the passage of the 19th Amendment, she turned her attention to civil rights, helping desegregate the restaurants in Washington, D.C. Thank you, Mary Terrell. We appreciate your work. And the last unsung Shiro black suffrage that I'm going to tell you about today is Mary Ann Shad Carey. She was born to parents dedicated to the abolition of slavery and who participated in the Underground Railroad. She was the first black woman publisher in North America and the first woman publisher in Canada. She relocated to Canada with the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law in 1850, which was this fucked up law that said that if you escape slavery, and went to a state that was considered free and didn't have slaves, you could still be brought back by a slave owner. So if you were an enslaved person and you escaped slavery to another state, you could be brought back and you were considered still enslaved. I hope that makes sense. It was a really messed up law. 
She came back to the U.S. eventually, and she ended up being widowed during the Civil War. She moved to Washington, D.C., where she taught in public schools and lectured around the country on women's rights and the suffrage movement. She studied law at Howard and graduated in 1883 as one of the first black female lawyers in the country. Now, there are countless other unsung sheroes, black suffrage that we should all know and that should be in our textbooks. But unfortunately, for the sake of time, I can't list them all, but I encourage you all to do a little research. You can even just do a simple Google search and you'll get a good handful of them, if not more. But now that we have some historical background on the formation of the black suffrage movement and the beef between the white suffrage and the black suffrage... Let's jump into the interview with journalist and writer Yvette Dion, author of Lifting As We Climb, The Black Woman's Battle to the Ballot Box. She helps us uncover the key things we should all know about the black woman's journey to gaining the right to vote, both past and present, because it's happening right now. So let's get into it. Hi, Yvette. Hi. Hi. Thank Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm very excited to have you here on this very special edition of That Wasn't In My Textbook podcast for the Well-Read Black Girl Festival. You know, the theme for the festival and for the podcast topic is about the Black suffrage movement, past and present. So it only felt right that we would talk to you, author of this beautiful book here that I've been like underlining, like I've like crazy, <laughs> like I've been writing in here, you know. Um, so it, I'm happy to sit down with you and talk about your wonderful book about, you know, the Black woman's ballot battle for the for the ballot and just to get your opinion on elections and what's going on this year and what it will look like in the future from COVID-19 and beyond. Well, I'm excited. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. I would like to just open up with you kind of like introducing yourself, telling us all the wonderful things that you do. I know you're also a journalist. You wear many hats. So could you please let the listeners know how dope you are? (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Um, Well, my name is Yvette Dion. Uh, I am a journalist. I consider myself a pop culture critic and a magazine editor. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm currently the editor-in-chief of Bitch Media, which is about to celebrate its 25th year. So I'm excited about that. Thank you. Um, And as you mentioned, I'm also um, the author of Lifting As We Climb, Black Women's um, Battle for the Ballot Box, which came out in April. It feels like it came out 100 years ago, (laughs) to be honest, (laughs) but it just came out in April. And then outside of that, I'm just a a freelance writer. I do freelance content creation, et cetera. Great. Thank you for that. And congratulations on your 25th anniversary. And I do feel you when you said like it feels like forever this year. Like even this week feels like forever. Everything just feels super slow. (laughs) And fast at the same time. Yeah. I can't believe it's almost the end of the year already. So one of the signature questions of the show is, oh, I always ask people to define whatever topic they are the expertise in. For you, my question is, how do you define suffrage and how would you define the Black suffrage movement? Yes. So I would say suffrage is an ongoing movement, even through today, Mm -hmm. to secure voting rights access for every person unencumbered. So no poll taxes, no passing a a test in order to vote. Like everyone has equal access to the ballot box without any restrictions or boundaries or obstacles. I would say the black suffrage movement in particular has been going on since before abolition. So the 1800s through now, and it's just a collection of black women, of black organizations that not only focused on suffrage, but have also focused on just larger community issues in general. So everything from how to best educate black children to how to end mass incarceration is all a part of the black suffrage movement. Great, yeah, I feel like that's what I really found interesting about your book was that you, you started with kind of like the anti-slavery abolition movement, because I think traditionally, and even when I looked up like suffrage, they talk about like political voting rights. Um, but it's more of, like you said, like a movement beyond just rights in 
in general and then specifically for different groups. So I thought that was really interesting because I feel like your book really kind of weaves through different historical periods, which is different than I think like your traditional textbook when they talk about like the suffrage movement. So I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you learn about the suffrage movement or in particularly what you talk about, like the black suffrage movement, the black vote in textbooks in your school? And if and, and what do you think, what part of your topic do you think should be included in textbooks if it's missing? Yeah, so I did not learn a whole lot about Black women's suffrage in particular in textbooks mm -hmm. from elementary school through junior high school, high school, college, not a whole lot. What mm -hmm. I did learn about suffrage focused a lot on white women suffragists and particularly Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth mm -hmm. King Stanton outside of them. All I knew was women got the right to vote in 1920. I did not know any of the history before that or after that. Uh, it was even disjointed in, you know, when we learned about civil rights, the civil rights movement, that was always separate from suffrage. Like they were never really connected in textbooks in any sort of way. So I would hope that if my book is ever taught in schools, that that is what's focused on, how all of these movements are really interconnected and intertwined and that you can find black women suffragists who are interconnected and intertwined throughout all of the movements. Yeah, that's I, that's I think that's what I learned the most from reading your book was just like starting with the abolition movement, talking about women that I never even heard of um, and how it was all connected and evolved from, OK, so we're looking for equality for black people and then we're going to talk about equality for women and voting and stuff like that. So I really appreciated how you kind of weave that together because I never made that connection. So I know a lot of people probably similar to you and I may have not learned about the suffrage, the black suffrage movement. And I'm not gonna make you summarize this really dope book so everyone should just go <laughs> read it. But what are some general things, like if someone's listening that you want them to walk away from understanding some general things, obviously, about the Black suffrage movement and how that impacts us today. Yeah, so I would say the biggest thing that I would want people to walk away with is knowing that when Black women faced uh, a lot of opposition, particularly from the mainstream suffrage organization, that they just created their own, mm -hmm. that they didn't settle for acceptance, like whether or not you accept me is going to stop my fight for this. They then form their own organizations through the Black Women's Club movement. That I think is, is huge for people to know. And not to say that that movement didn't have its own set of problems. It had many problems. It was very classist and mm. was really obsessed with colorism. It had its own share of problems. But the point is that Black women decided rather than relying on, on white women for acceptance that they would simply create their own organizations. That I feel like is a model for how we can approach the work that we do today. Um, the second thing that I, I think that people should know is that this fight is ongoing, that mm -hmm. all of these movements are, are interconnected. Like the book starts in the 1800s, it ends in the present day. Like the fight for voting rights is an ongoing continuous thing because like Sarah Maps Douglas realized like freedom really is fragile. Like the gains that you make are never permanent. You have to fight for them over and over and over again, which of course is depressing. I understand why and that tiring. would be depressing. Yeah. <laughs> right, and tiring and exhausting. But these women were really willing to fight for something bigger than themselves, even things that they may not live to see. Like it was very intentional for me as I moved kind of from generation to generation to say that these people died before this happened. Like this Ooh. person didn't make it. This is who they passed the baton off to, to show that not only do leaders stay in a leadership position, but they're also thinking about what comes after when they're no longer able, or they're no longer here. Like who can they train up to take the baton and, and move forward? That's really important. Mm -hmm. But also that the final thing I would want people to know just in broad strokes is that the civil rights movement for me is, it's a big deal to me, primarily because Black women led that in mm -hmm. some respects and did not gain their just due. I was so sad to have to limit that to a single chapter. Um, it really deserves its own text about the Black women of the civil rights movement. But the amount of work that they did and the groundwork that they laid 
for us to only remember Rosa Parks and only remember her as this feeble elderly woman who sat down on a bus is just a travesty. And it's yeah. a, a, a it's a disservice. And I can see it repeating itself when we look back on the moment we're in now around racial justice and the protests that are happening. Who gets remembered from that is really important. Like we don't want to echo that trauma again. Mm-hmm. So it's important to pay attention to who gets archived and who gets to to have their papers put away somewhere for when they're longer here so they can be properly credited for their role in, in a movement. That's great. And I think I, I loved all those things that you said, but I also really in particular like the last point that you made, because I feel like that is part of the the challenge with even me having this podcast. Like the inspiration was just like, there is so much history that is not taught in our textbooks and particularly black history. It's condensed yeah. into 28 days, you know, and then it has to be summarized and we can't talk about everyone and everything. Um, and I feel like that's just like really unfair. And so this platform is to kind of spread the knowledge beyond just the few people that we know. Um, I love that. Yeah. So I appreciate you saying that. Cause that really like touched my heart. <laughs> um, um, now, what inspired you to write this great book about, you know, the ballot and the Black vote and women in particular, Black women? Well, I always say I got lucky, really. <laughs> so okay. um, the, the book originally started as an article for Teen Vogue. I believe I published that article in 2017 or so. The editor there approached me to write that article. And that was the first time that I started to dive into suffrage at all. Mm. Um, And then after that, uh, about a year later or so, an editor at Viking who actually retired in the process of this book, but um, named Sheila Keenan, she approached me about writing the book. So she had read the article. She knew that they wanted to, that the publisher Viking wanted to release a book um, tied to the centennial of the 19th Amendment that focused on Black women suffragists. And so she approached me and asked me if I was interested I've never written for a younger audience before. I've always written nonfiction, but never for an audience that young. So I was a little nervous at first and and wavered on whether or not to say yes. But then I realized that I would be releasing the book at a time when my nieces would be old enough to read it. And so that's what convinced me to say yes and go through with the project. That's beautiful. That is a beautiful story of how just like everything kind of aligned yeah. and just like worked out. I really, really like that. Um, I, you said that you were hesitant about making it for young adults because I'm reading the book. I mean, I'm almost done. The layout of it is very much similar to a textbook a little bit because you have like these little pop-up sections in the pages that go into bios about different women that we may not know about, different women in the suffrage movement and their background and their contribution. And so why do you think it's important for, you know, I guess the editors wanted you to do young adults, but why do you think it's important for like young adults to understand the suffrage movement? Even though this book, if you're listening, is for everybody. Like I said, I'm reading it and I'm learning a lot. But um, could you talk about kind of like your demographic and why you think that was important, especially during this time, you know, with the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment? Yeah, so I say all the time that I used to be an educator, Mm -hmm. I used to teach eighth graders, and I just realized through that experience how intelligent they are, and that we really do underestimate their ability to make sense of, even for us as adults, what seems really intangible, like they can not only understand it, but they can then make sense of it and put it into action in their own lives. I wanted this book to do that for them when it comes specifically to mobilizing them either to vote or to be civically engaged in some other way. I think so often we are patronizing to children, especially children this age range, like junior high school, going into high school. We treat them as if they're not old enough to make the decisions for themselves, but they're old enough to be punished for making the wrong decision. Mm. But we don't empower them. We don't educate them. We don't teach them about their history and the lineage in which they come from. 
we don't really bestow them with that sort of dignity of knowing that you come from this lineage of amazing Black women who have done all of these things in our country's history for social change. And so I think it's important, especially if you're a teacher or a parent or just have young people in your life, to be as honest with them as possible. Like there's no reason why children today are still learning about Christopher Columbus, for instance, that he <laughs> sailed the blue, you know? Like, yeah. It, it's so Bullshit. <laughs> yeah. So I think children today too are a little different than when I came up. I'm 31 now. So I, when I was coming up, like we really didn't have the internet and there really wasn't social media and we were still dialing up. Mm-hmm. Children have everything at the, at their fingertips now. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's up to us to make sure that they know correct history and they have critical media literacy skills because otherwise they're just being bombarded with information that's incorrect and they can't even start to make sense of it. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm I'm 33, so I, I remember those dial-up days. Yeah, dial-up you. days. <laughs> yeah. So your first chapter is called Not the History You Learned in School, similar to the title of this podcast, <laughs> um, which is great. But I wanted to start off with some, to just to let people know some of the things that are in this book. Could you tell us maybe two or three, you know, not in your textbook, Black suffrage that people should know about or could learn, should go and learn more about. Because you even, I remember one part in the book, you talk about Sojourner Truth, which I didn't even know that she was six feet tall. And at one point, people were questioning if she was a woman. And she actually flashed in one to prove that point, which is um, just like memorable things that you learn, which is also really kind of fucked up that she had to do all that. Um, right. But at the same time, are there any other? women, I think oftentimes we do hear about Sojourner Truth, but are there any other women in the movement that you think people should look into and know about that you mentioned here? Because there's so, there's so many, but if you just think there's of so the top many. of your head, yeah. I know it was yeah. a question. <laughs> um, that is a tough question because there are so many women, but if I had to pick a few, yeah. Um, the first for me is always Sarah Maps Douglas who was alive in the 1800s. She was an educator. She was born free in Philadelphia. And what was really interesting to me about her is that she became involved in the fight for abolition because she realized how fragile freedom was. She had grown up in a, a prominent family in Philadelphia. She had never been enslaved. But when she realized that it was possible for free people to be kidnapped and returned to slavery, even though they had never been enslaved, it mobilized her. And so mm. she's really important in the book because she saw education really as a gateway to understanding freedom. And then once you're educated through a book club or uh, she would host these book clubs in her home, Um, But once you're educated in that way, it's your job to educate others. Um, So she's really, really interesting to me in the book. I would also, of course, pick Anna Julia Cooper, who some people would say is a controversial figure, um, but was also an educator, a writer, one of the first Black women in the world to get a doctorate, um, was really involved on the suffrage end. So after the passage of the 15th Amendment, And she's controversial because she believed in this idea of racial uplift, which (laughs) is kind of like the precursor to what we call respectability politics Mm, now, that (laughs) if you lift yourself up by the bootstraps that you will gain white people's respect. Mm -hmm. But she's really interesting because she was theorizing the South at a time when a lot of people weren't paying attention to the South as a hotbed for social change. Mm. She was one of the people saying, let me tell you how it really is. And let me tell you how we can improve Black conditions in the South in this moment. So she's really interesting. And then the last woman, and even though she's a modern woman, I think that all people should know about what Stacey Abrams is doing yeah. in Georgia. I know that she lost her gubernatorial election in Georgia, mm-hmm. but she runs this organization called Fair Fight. Its goal is to register voters specifically in Georgia in order to just change the way that things happen there. As we've seen with COVID, as we've seen with the fact that her opponent stole that election, like she should have won that election. Mm -hmm. As we see with voter suppression, we see that the lines right now are 12 hours long for people to vote. Like she is a really integral figure right now in figuring out what voting rights can look like in the future. Wow. I really appreciate that that you put past and present because that's that's the thing yeah. we have going on so I really appreciate that now I think one of the main things that you even address here on different points 
was kind of like the divide in the suffrage movement, right? At one point there was, there was supposed to be unity where black women and white women were fighting together. And it seemed like, you know, in the opening of your book, especially you seem to also frame it as like, you know, when it came to anti-slavery, everyone seemed to be relatively on the same page. Um, but then when we started talking about voting rights, um, that's when we kind of see the divide between even black men and black women, you know, black men kind of not even being on board with that. And also, you know, white women feeling like they should get, should be first. Can you talk more so about that divide, um, and how it even still plays out today? Yeah, it's disappointing. Yeah, <laughs> it's disappointing I know. To, and it's, it's complicated. It. Yeah. You know, it's disappointing to see that that same pattern kind of echo over and over again. But the 15th Amendment really split the suffrage movement in half. So after the Civil War, when the United States made its first and only effort to um, atone for slavery, we went through the period of Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And as a part of that, um, the United States Congress passed the 15th Amendment, which was supposed to allow all men, regardless of their race or ethnicity, to vote. There were some people on the side of allowing Black men to gain the right to vote, and then there were some people who were questioning, why is it that Black men are allowed to vote, but women still aren't allowed to vote? Mm -hmm. And so it, it literally split the suffrage movement in half. Um, out of that formed a new organization that was specifically focused on first getting Black men the right to vote and then protecting that right. I think as we all know at this point, it still took <laughs> years, decades. Way too long. <laughs> right, in order for Black men to gain the right to vote without being lynched or threatened with some other form of violence. Um, but we see that play out now mm -hmm. in the fact that, you know, people seem to think that when someone else gains power, that they're losing something. Exactly. Instead of the suffragists who were opposed to the 15th Amendment saying, okay, let's support the 15th Amendment and then build a bigger coalition of people who can come together to ensure that women get the right to vote. It was immediately perceived as an affront to all the work that white suffragists have been doing to gain the right to vote. And so rather than going that coalition building route, they chose to align themselves with white suffragists in the South in particular who advocated for lynching and were fine, you know, showing up to a Black person's house and shooting out their windows uh. because they attempted to register to vote. Mm. And so it, it eventually, of course, it, it ended in the 19th Amendment in 1920. Mm -hmm. But because of that historical split, we've just been seeing it echo over and over and over again. You exactly. even see it play out on social media. You see it play out in the 2016 election. Yeah. As politicians try to build coalitions of voters, you always see, well, we need the white vote. And even with someone like Donald Trump, yeah. it's like, you can see it split literally of mm -hmm. who was voting for him and who was not. Like who was willing to vote um, in their own self-interest, even if it comes at the expense of everyone else. Yeah, yeah. And I remember them giving us stats around me and like I think it was like fifty something or forty something percent of white women voted for Trump. And yes. just like those crazy numbers um for the two thousand sixteen election and just showing this like continuous, you know, divide that I don't know, maybe one day it will not be that way. But I think you framed it really well that a lot of people see one group's liberation as a slight to them and they don't think that we all can be liberated, you know. Unfortunately, in America, we have a lot of issues to tackle and we can't tackle them all at the same time. But it doesn't mean that you have to like, you know, be threatened or and stuff like that by other people's empowerment. So that was that was really interesting to see to to read about it in this book because I didn't read about I didn't learn about the suffrage movement at all in school. Um, so especially not the black one. I think like Susan B. Anthony, I remember her name. Um, but to really like have a text that you like you've written by a black woman that is explaining historically when these different divides happen. Cause we all talk about the divide now, especially, you know, with the elections coming up, by the time this yeah. comes out, I think we will have voted. They might still be counting. Um, but <laughs> I feel like, you know, I never could pinpoint exactly when it started and to have this book kind of frame it and show like, okay, you know, in the beginning, everyone was anti-slavery, but once, you know, the 15th Amendment came around, that's when the divides started to happen. And that's why it still plays out today. And that was just like my, a mind blowing moment for me. So thank you for that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I really appreciate that. How do you think 
this pandemic is going to affect the future of voting because we've never had so many people sending in absentee va ballots. We've never been in this situation before. Do you think there'll be anything positive that comes out of this in terms of the elections? Or like, what do you think, what's the future if we are gonna be having pandemics and stuff like that? I wish I was optimistic. I, know, I really right? do. <laughs> because the pandemic to me, the one thing that it did present positively is that there are alternative options that are effective and efficient for voting. Yeah. I live in a state where nearly the majority of the population does mail-in voting. I get a ballot every election cycle. Oh, I fill nice. it out, I drop it off at the library. It's just standard now and the and it's effective. You can even go into an app and it'll tell you where your where your ballot is. Nice. Um, that sort of efficiency is what I expected. I don't know why I expected that because that is not what's happening. Yeah. Because because we live in a country where people, where public servants are obsessed with power. It's less about how do you be in best service to the public. It's all about both getting into power and then maintaining power. Mm. There is a coordinated effort to stop mail-in voting, to make it as difficult as possible, yeah. to force people to choose between risking their health and voting um, and so it, it really does boil down to where you live, mm -hmm. which to me is a shame. Like there should be a coordinated federal effort to ensure that everyone gets a ballot through the mail. They can drop it off and it will be counted. The fact that that is not happening makes me really sad. It's also unsurprising. I wish I were more surprised by, you know, like the governor of Texas trying to eliminate the places where you can drop a mail-in ballot. Like I wish I were surprised or more surprised by that but it's also just sad. Like it should not be that way in what we call a democracy. I know. And like, I'm in California. They've been having fake drop-off ballots being planted on different blocks because mm. they have, they have drop-off ballots and they look official, but then they have some that are unofficial that are being dropped off so that people's ballots won't be counted. And yeah. I've always just wondered, like technology is so advanced. Like why can't we vote through our phones? Like, when is that going to be a thing? <laughs> like it should it's, be it should be we should be trying to make voting in this country as easy as possible for every single person mm -hmm. but the united states has never really even attempted to live up to its ideals fully and so trying to attack voting rather than and typically it's conservatives who are attacking voting and specifically mail-in voting. Mm -hmm. Instead of them trying to create a party platform that appeals to the broadest group of people possible, they say, it's fine. More people can become liberal in the United States. We're just going to make it more difficult for you to express your opinion through gerrymandering, mm -hmm. through making it as difficult as possible to vote. It's really disappointing. But what I tell people is if if your vote did not have any power, people would not go to the lengths that they go to to try to stop people from voting, like okay. passing voter ID laws and sending case after case through the lower courts in hopes that it gets to the Supreme Court. Like that is a very aggressive and rabid approach to trying to stop people from voting. Yeah, and if it really didn't matter, they wouldn't go through all those loops and holes. Exactly. Go through all that. So that's a great point. Um, so thank you for that. Your last chapter of your book is called Continuing the Climb, which I thought was really good. So what are some things that you think, I mean, you've already kind of touched on it, like voter suppression um, and, you know, the, the Atlanta governor race. But what are some things that you think we should fight for, like continue to fight for and how we can fight for them if you have any resources for people? Yeah. So one of the things that I took away from the suffrage movement, especially the black suffrage movement, is that voting was just a tool mm. for them. It was a political tool in order to achieve all of these other aims. I think that we have to see it that way as well in our current moment. It becomes really easy to want um, politicians who are perfectly in alignment with us ideologically I don't think that that's possible and I don't think it's a reasonable demand to make only because, you know, voting is not the end all be all to being civically engaged. And when we do talk about, you know, voting, we often talk about who's at the top of the ballot mm -hmm. instead of thinking 
broadly about who are the people in our local communities who are running for office, what organizations exist to prepare people to run for office and to help them raise money. Like politics is a rich person's game. So if you don't already have wealth, it may be difficult to build a coalition and the resources to help you run for office. Those are the things I think people should be paying attention to. Mm -hmm. And then using, using voting as a way of bringing uh, a larger awareness to these issues that people genuinely care about. So if you really are passionate about defunding the police, for instance, it's important to realize who's on your city council, who would have the power to do that. And to figure out there are people in your community who are uniquely positioned to run for that and just need a little help getting over the hump. Those are the sorts of things that are important. Like who is on your school board? If you care about the education of black and brown children in your community, especially during the pandemic, it's important to know who all is on your school board. So if things are not going well, you know exactly where to go and who to talk to and what meetings to be present at. That sort of local engagement and activism is really important. And I think it sometimes gets lost in the horse race that we see where the only people, the only people that our national media talks about are Donald Trump and Joe Biden or Mike Pence and Kamala Harris or the Senate majority leader or the House leader. There are people on our local level who really do impact our day to day lives. Those are the people to pay attention to. Yes, yes. I have, I feel like in the past couple of years, I just started getting involved in my, you know, local elections and I just moved to LA. I enjoy the at-home ballot because I feel like I can really like sit down and like yes. take more time to figure out who's who and what is involved. And I'm hoping that they, I don't know if they do that option for um, local elections, that, but I'm just like, this is something I could appreciate where I could sit down at the computer and really do my due diligence as a like conscious voter and not just checking off party members and really kind of like, you know, what you said, really seeing, okay, if I really believe in defunding the police, who is doing that? Who and who on your local level can you tap in with? Even if it's not someone there, like if, if electoral politics are not your thing, fine. Like, I think that that's perfectly reasonable that some people are just disinvested from electoral politics. Who are the local folks who are organizing around these issues. Like it, it's not that defund the police becomes a national conversation if people had been organizing about it for the last five or six years. Mm-hmm. Who are those people? Who can you pay attention to and be tapped in with and organize with and do the work with so that when it gets to the national level, you know exactly who you can rely on, who you're in community with, et cetera. Okay. Um, like here, um, I live in Colorado. They send a... Uh, literally a booklet of every law Mm -hmm. yeah those are the sorts of things that people should pay attention to and like sit down with and skim through even if you don't have time to read every single thing so you know exactly who you're voting for what you're voting for if there's say a um a bill that you have questions about figure out the organizations that are working for that bill and working to not get it passed like those are the sorts of that's the sort of work and groundwork that we need to be doing yes What do you say to people who feel like they don't want to vote? What's your response to that? Um, Especially as a historian and someone who's done research on the work that our ancestors have done to get us here. Yeah, so I'm I'm of the mindset that I don't believe in voter shaming folks because I don't think it's effective. Yeah, I agree. Because I don't think, like it's difficult (laughs) to tell people who don't want to vote, like, especially when they see what's happening with voter suppression, it's so difficult to say you should vote anyway. When we see sometimes that, you know, it, it, it can make a difference, but not all of the difference. So Mm -hmm. what I, what I tell people who are just disengaged entirely is to find an issue For some people, it's abortion rights. For some people, it's mass incarceration. For some people, it's decriminalizing drug use or decriminalizing sex work. Find an issue Mm -hmm. and get involved around that issue, whatever it may be. And whether that has to become, like you become a phone banker or you sit in on an interest meeting, just figure out something that you can get passionately engaged around because often that's where people's political education starts. 
you know, Mm -hmm. not everyone gets to go to college and sit in a classroom and and read and study in a group of like-minded people. Many people get politically involved either because of a tragedy, Mm -hmm. like someone being killed by the police or because you've had the opportunity to, to find an issue that you're passionate about and it becomes a gateway for bigger politics. That's where I think people should start. And if after that, you really don't want to vote, I would encourage you to be involved in some way in your community. Yeah. Whatever that looks like. For some people, that's just organizing. For some people, that's helping to free incarcerated people. For some people, that is talking to to children on a weekly basis, whatever it is. Everyone can be an engaged citizen, even if they don't vote. But you need to be engaged in some way in order to be a part of the civic process. I love that. I love, I'm, a, I'm against all shaming. So, yeah, you know, people are travel shaming right now. I'm against it. I'm against voter shaming. I'm against <laughs> all of it. So if people are listening right now and they read your wonderful book first, you know, Lift As We Climb, and they want to maybe dig deeper into some of these individuals, do you have any resources for them? Or just like, maybe not just the individuals, just the Black suffrage movement. Um, do you have any resources for them outside of obviously your book? You should definitely, if you're listening, read the book. But um, if they wanted to maybe do a deeper search or maybe if there's like a cool IG account or YouTube channel, because there's so many ways to educate yourself now. Mm-hmm. Um, so is there any way, any other resources that maybe people wouldn't know that could help them learn more about this important, you know, Black suffrage movement that's definitely not in our textbook? Yeah, there's one other book. I know we said an unusual, an unusual <laughs> source, but there's another book. I call it my sister book. It's the okay. adult version of my book called Vanguard nice. by Dr. Martha S. Jones, um, who was, I was actually just in conversation with recently. She's amazing. That book is longer and more extensive and also includes a lot more resources as well. Mm-hmm. Um The other thing that I would encourage people to do, some of the information that I found, particularly after the Civil War, is readily accessible. Like, Mm. for instance, Ida B. Wells Barnett's, um, all of her papers and her photos are at the University of Chicago, and they have a digital archive. So you can go into the digital archive and see everything. Like, everything that she turned over is there. It's free. It's easy to access. Anything that you want to find, often you can find through the Library of Congress. You can look at the Black Museum in D.C. after the African American Museum in D.C. They have an online digital archive. You can look through there. Like, that's where I found the coolest things. Um, If you just want to go and see all of the photos there are to see of Ida B. Wells and her kids, like, that information exists. You just need to Google it. Oh, I'm going to go do that after this. Yeah. I love stuff like that. My last question is my signature question of the show, but it's going to be hard because you already have a book. (laughs) (laughs) But my signature, the last question is the signature question is that if you could only write a chapter in a textbook about the black woman's suffrage movement, what would you name it and why? What would I name it and why? Um... If I had to pick a single chapter, I would definitely focus on the passage of the 15th Amendment and the split between white suffragists and black suffragists at the time. Mm. Because I feel like it's the one thing that if you're in this moment and you're on social media feels, they call them Karens now, mm. but it feels very relevant. Yes. Um, and I would call it the age old Karen problem. Ooh, I like that. Well, that that's it for all the questions that I have. I mean, I want you to kind of end it by plugging, letting people know where they can find you online. You know, definitely support by buying her book, Lift As We Climb. Tell us if you have any other projects or any other things that people can check you out at and then where they can find you all over the interwebs. Yes. So if you want to find my day job work, that is bitchmedia.org. I always encourage people to purchase um, Lifting As We Climb from an independent bookstore Mm -hmm. if they can or through bookshop.org. Support your independence, especially right now um, during a pandemic. If you want to find me on the internet, um, it's Free Black Girl on Instagram and Twitter. And I'm pretty sure Yvette Dion Ryder on Facebook. 
Um, and then I do have some products I'm working on. None that I can talk about yet, oh. but <laughs> announcement soon. Okay. Well, that's exciting that you have a lot I'm of I'm excited. Yes. Well, I'm already following you on all those interwebs. So I'll just be on the lookout for when you, when you announce them. <laughs> And thank you so much again for joining me today. I've learned so much. I really appreciate you. Thank you for adding this knowledge to my library, to all of our libraries. And yeah, have a great day. And that is the conclusion of episode 11, this very special Well-Read Black Girl Festival episode that I'm so excited to be a part of. Thank you so much, Glory, for inviting me to be a part of this dope Black historical moment. I appreciate you. I advise you to definitely check out this festival this weekend. Go to wellreadblackgirl.com. Look at all the links and lists of events so you can participate in these weekend festivities. Okay, that's my first piece of advice. I also want to thank you for listening to this extra special, extra long episode. If you want to watch the episode, you can check it out on That Wasn't In My Textbook YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this episode and learned something new, help us sister out by subscribing or leaving a little review. It don't have to be long. Make sure to follow That Wasn't In My Textbooks all over the interwebs. We have a website that includes show notes and links to our dope, dope guests. And if you're feeling frisky and you're not poor from the pandemic, we also have a donation button. No pressure at all. I just have to say it. And don't forget to come back on Friday, November 20th for our next episode. Thanks again for your time. Enjoy the festival this weekend. And until next time, remember, knowledge is power.